new faces and some new ones. I'm trying to remember. My goal is to know every student's name by Christmas, so let me know how I'm doing. Um, we have with us today a special guest. Um, Rob uh, ha has been with us, uh, he came last year, and his seminar got like the highest reviews that we've had, so we're so glad you could come back to see us again. Um, Rob is, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, VP for Operations for Algae Systems. It's obviously a sustainable company based out of Mobile, Alabama. And the expertise he brings to us is basically he's been in the chair across from the interviewee. So he'll give you a perspective of what he looks for when he hires employees in his field. Um, and then um, another announcement I was going to make is we have an open house next month and also a dinner. Um, and the goal of our dinner this year, it's our first ever, is to introduce our alumni and our current students so that you can kind of find out from them, you know, what did you do, what did you do right when you're looking for jobs, um, and just kind of be able to network a little bit. So I hope that um, you'll consider coming to our dinner next month. <coughs> with that, I'll introduce uh, Rob. All right. Thank you. Uh, Okay, are you ready? How hard was it to catch this piece of candy? What makes it hard? Not knowing. Not being fully prepared. Not being ready to catch it. I'm just throwing you a piece of candy. Once everybody saw the candy coming, you're ready for it. And now it's not difficult. It's the same thing with getting ready for an interview. It's all in the preparation. Once you're ready, the interview is not difficult at all. It's all in the preparation. That's why I want to call this getting prepared for effective interviewing. Now, you know a lot about this because you take tests. That's what we do in college, right? They're stupid, but we do them. What's the difference between a hard test and an easy test? One you prepared for and one you didn't prepare for. Right. What does being prepared give you? Advantage. Edge. How? Because you're ready. You know what to expect. You know what to expect. You know what the answers are. If I said your college graduation is going to depend on taking this math test, how many of you are worried about it? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Because you know this information. There's nothing I can throw at you that involves simple math and addition and subtraction that's going to throw you. Because you know the material forward and backwards. Are you going to be worried about this test? No, that's how ready you need to be going into a job interview. What's the subject matter you need to know? And it's really scary that nobody knows. What's listed? How does the business make money? Close. That's part of it. That's half of it. It's mission statement? Or huh? It's mission or it's goal? yourself. You're the subject matter that you have to know going forward and backward. And that's what most people don't take the time to learn. That sounds dumb because we should know ourselves, right? Better than anybody. But we don't. All we know is we've got this piece of paper that we hand somebody and then we know we need a job and that's about it. And then we go to the job interview and we hope and hope is a lousy business plan. It never works. What we gotta do is know the subject matter, where the subject matter, and we gotta know how to apply that subject matter so that we communicate our value in a way that others perceive the value on their terms. And that's where the magic happens. That's what we're gonna talk about today, the preparing part of it. Now, how many of you know that interviewing stuff? Services. Oh, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> you, you thought I was talking about you, right? <laughs> oh, no, I don't care about you. I'm talking about, I'm talking about this guy, the interviewer. It's tough on the interviewer. I don't care if it's tough on the interviewee. The interviewer is there trying to make a living, trying to earn the company money, trying to make the company money so I can make my bonus. That's what I really care about. And the fact is, most of the people that come to the job interview are grossly, grossly underprepared 
or unprepared completely, which means what to me? Waste of time. My time that's valuable. The more time I waste on unprepared job candidates, the harder it is for me to make my numbers and make my bucks. So you come at people from their perspectives. You gotta sell yourself on their terms. You gotta see what's going on with them. We cannot keep going to the job interview and just hoping for the job. We've got to be ready. And you, you find out when you get in the real world, there's only about 5% of the people that even show up know what the subject matter is, are ready to be fully interviewed, <laughs> ready and fully prepared for the interview, and they stand out. The rest of them are just this sea of people that you can tell the minute they walk in the door, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. That's what we got to do is confront that issue going forward. Because from the interviewer's perspective, the default answer is always going to be no. No, 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 no. The harm a bad employee can do to my company far exceeds the benefit a really good employee or a mediocre employee, which is what most people are. That's what the bell curve dictates. Most people are going to be mediocre right in the middle. The benefit you're going to provide my company being a mediocre employee is dwarfed by the incredible harm a bad employee that sneaks through can cause my company. So the default answer is always going to be no. And from me, from the interviewer's perspective, the quicker I get to know, the easier it is for me in the interview because then I can just coast to the end, ask you a couple more questions that are all standardized because the people in career services or HR tell me you've got to ask the same thing of the same people. And you know, I've got to be polite so that I don't get sued and don't get some rumor mill going about me. But otherwise than that, the minute that I made a decision, no, you're not the candidate, the interview is easy. It's a waste of my time, but it's easy at that point. Okay? You understand that part of it. So, anything that I can do as the interviewer that gets me to know quicker makes it even better for me. In fact, the best no I can find is the one that tells me no before you even get scheduled for an interview. That way you don't waste any of my time. How am I going to find out information that's going to let me say no even quicker than waiting on you to give some off-the-cuff answer that you don't even know what you're talking about. Well, maybe I'm going to have to go out there and you, have you ever heard of this? It's brand new. It's never been yet. Everybody know what this is? Google? I'm going to go out there and search for your name. I'm going to go out there and hunt for you, find out what kind of paper trail I can find out there in the ether and see what there is about you out there. And the quicker I find out something out there that says, nope, that's not the candidate, I don't even waste my time scheduling an interview. I don't waste any of my time at that point. So, from the interviewer's perspective, we need to know what they can find. What can they find? All kinds of stuff. Now, I'm sorry, I, when I was your age, I was easily as stupid as all of you. Maybe combined. The only difference between you and me is I did not have a tool in which I could broadcast to the world forever how stupid I am. And today, we do have the ability to broadcast to the world how stupid we are. And it won't ever go away. And I don't know anybody that is saying, I need a new job candidate. If I could only find somebody that could do this, I'd be sick. Okay? Scrub your pages clean. Get this crap off of there, okay? Get the comments off of your Facebook page. When somebody's using profanity on your Facebook page, you can get in there and delete it. Clean your page up. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to look for this stuff. And if I see, oh, so that's what they're doing when they should be doing uh, that overtime bid package that needs to be due tomorrow. No, no, I'm not going to even waste my time interviewing clean your pages up, get past this. What you do need to do is to leave a paper trail out there in the ether that somebody can find. How many of you are on LinkedIn right now? How many of you have a fully developed LinkedIn page? Good, very good. Is that, are you done then, right? 
How much does LinkedIn cost? Nothing. Free. Most of what I'm going to talk about is free. Free is the best price on the planet. How many of you have your own websites? Very cool. How much does that cost? Ten bucks a month. Ten bucks a month? Oh my God, somebody's ripping you off. <laughs> you can get your own URL for like, what, 12, 15 bucks a year? Go to GoDaddy or any, I'm not, this is just what I use. You can, I'm not advocating them. You go to anywhere you want. GoDaddy gets your UL, URL. Mine's robmacroype.com. Put your name in it. You don't have to give up everything else you've been doing the rest of your life. Just establish a new professional presence on the web that other people can go find. It's Google. Okay? Then you want to make that thing pop. Go to a site like Wix that has website templates. Again, they're free. God, I don't know that price. You set it up. It's plug and play. You don't have to know HTML or anything else like that. It's there's hundreds of website templates on there. Take a day and find one that really speaks to you and fill it out and get you something that really looks good. I've got multiple pages on here. People can download my resume. They can set me up for public speaking. Here's my past accomplishments, my contact information. It's Googleable. I'm leaving a paper trail out there of what I'm involved in, what my accomplishments are, what groups I'm working with that all speaks to the interviewer. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if I'm setting up an interview and I've got a choice between having somebody come in that's got a professional web presence or somebody that likes to post pictures of himself with his head wrapped in masking tape, which one am I going to set up? Does this make sense? <coughs> Stun silence is what I'm always shooting for with this, okay? It's okay to yell things back. You can throw things if you want, okay? It doesn't matter how much you get liked. And this is where we have a problem with people in, in college, is we're all hung up on what we look like to our friends. And you really got a simple decision to make. You can look cool to your friends, or you can get a job. Okay? I don't care which. I really don't. It's your choice. But pick one, because you really can't do both. Okay? And this will be a theme that keeps coming up and coming up and coming up. <coughs> It's about preparation. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to need to have an email address. How many of you have an email address you're proud to put on a resume? Okay. How many of you have an email address you'd never in a million years put on a resume? That's okay too. You don't have to give it up, but what you do need to do is establish one or two. I've got Rob at RobMacroyPE.com, and I've got RobMacroyPE at gmail.com. Use either one of them. And then you can always point those to wherever it is you check your mail all the time. It, that's okay. It doesn't matter. But get yourself a proper sounding email address so that you can put it on your resume, something that people can send information to your uh, place of residence. <coughs> and if you get involved on online blogs, it's an online presence that can ping back to you. That makes sense. Okay? Now, if I'm in HR and I'm going to set up a job interview with you, how am I going to do that? New technology. What do we call it? Come on, just yell out the answer. I know Telephone. Them. Telephone. There we go. Good. Good job. Telephone. Two things come up. Now, how do you answer the phone? Yo, dog, what up? Hey. What's up? <laughs> so you've got to start answering the phone properly. Rob McElroy, whatever. Answer the phone properly. What happens if they don't get you? What happens if you can't answer the phone? What do they get? Voicemail. Voicemail. What does your voicemail sound like? Dude, you know the drill. Beep. <laughs> Man, if I wasn't so hammered, I'd be able to answer the phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> Leave me a message when I sober up and call you back. Beep. You got a choice. Have something that sounds cool to your friends, or have something that's going to, you know, is any HR manager going to leave a message after that? No! Have something professional. You've reached Rob McElroy. I'm sorry, I can't take your call right now. Please leave me a message. I'll call you back as soon as I'm able. Thank you. Put your name in it. 
because it's very, very frustrating when I'm not 100% sure I got the right number down and I get this, you have dialed 555 292. I don't even know if I got the right person. Go ahead and put your name in it. It's not that much of a security risk, okay? It lets me know that I got the right person I'm leaving it for. The other thing you need to do is if you don't have, if, if you don't use your cell phone that you can control and you're leaving your house phone, how is everybody else in your house? or your fraternity house answering the phone to this HR manager, okay? And when you're establishing your voicemail, don't do it while you're driving down the road where I can hear road noise and everything. Don't have dogs barking in it. Don't have music in it. Nothing cute, just straightforward voicemail, okay? Make sense? All right, professionals have a business card. How many of you have a business card? Good. How many of you should have a business card? Better answer. What does a business card need to have on it? Name, occupation, phone number, email. Your contact information. How can I get a hold of you? Why? Why do you need one? I go to the website. No, I contact you. Who are you going to leave it with? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody gets a business card. It's a little trail of breadcrumbs you leave all throughout the business that you're going to interview with. The receptionist gets one. You bump into somebody in the hall. Oh, that's Ted from IT. Oh, hey, Ted. I'm Ron. Nice to meet you. Everybody gets a business card. And you try to get a business card from everybody else. Why is a business card so important? It's an easy visual and something that they can hold on to. Absolutely. It also helps if you've got some strange name. If your name's John Smith, nobody's wondering how to pronounce it or how to spell it. If you're... Yablotsky Yadovich. What? What was you know, you're logging in with the receptionist and they gotta write all this stuff down, but I've got to remember that when I call the HR. It helps. Hey, I'm Rob McRoy. Here's my card. I'm here to see Miss Smith. It helps with that. That makes sense. Alright, get you a business card. You don't need a lot of them. I'm just over staples today. You get 500 for 10 bucks. You don't even need to that many. Go in with a couple friends, get the uh, perforated ones that you just print out on a laser printer, and just print you a couple. If you see a style you like even better, then you haven't wasted a whole bunch of money on business cards that you want to change. Okay? That makes sense. All right. Oh, my God, we had not even gotten to the interview yet. This is what I'm talking about. Preparation is what it's all about. It's about all the work that goes into getting ready to go to the interview that's so important. Now, I, I, I did want to talk to you about a job. But before I do that, I need to sell you something. I've got this widget here, and it's a thousand dollars today only. How many of y'all want to buy a widget from me for a thousand bucks? Nobody. Okay, how about okay five hundred dollars? I really gotta sell these things. Five. Nobody. A hundred dollars. They may got a hundred dollars to they give me for this widget. Why not? Ten bucks. Why not? It doesn't have value. I don't either. <laughs> Does it have any value? Oh, wait. What if I said, oh, this is a perfected technology out of NASA. You just plug it into the gas tank in your car and you fill your car up with your garden hose. Your car gets 100 miles a gallon on hose water with zero pollution. Here's a $1,000. <laughs> Do you see the difference? <laughs> Now, how much did I really need to sell one of these come into play? Zero? How much does money in your pocket come into play? A lot. When you're selling yourself, you're the product. And what you're focusing on is not, I really need a job. It's, I really need to solve your problem. I am aspirin to your pain. That's what you got to be focused on the entire time. It's about selling, but it's about selling on their terms, not yours. Your terms don't need to come up as long as you're answering their problem. You're the solution to their problem. You're the answer to their pain. That's what makes you valuable. That's what you got to focus on going forward. Now, what we have a problem with is a lot of us, you know, we've, all we've done is go to school for years. So we don't have any practical real world. Yeah, I've been working in business for 25 years. Yeah, I can go and say, well, I've been an engineer. So it's easy for me to do that. How do you go out and say, well, I've never worked in an engineering job, but I want to work as an engineer for your company? Or fill in the blank. Most of you, all of you, have never done the job 
you're here to learn how to do, right? Almost by definition. What we have is transferable skills, and we've got to think outside the box with this thing and be a little open-minded with it and understand how skills in one area can translate into other areas. For instance, there's a lot of people <coughs> with fabulous careers in American professional football that started out playing soccer. Why? Okay, team sport, what else? Fast speed, what else? Coordination. Motivation. Motivation. Teamwork. Teamwork. Endurance. If I go into a coach for an American <laughs> football team and say, I've been playing soccer for years, does that win the game? Make them do all the work? Make them make all the connections? No, it's up to me. Oh. Hi, and I've been playing soccer for 12 years. Did you know I can run the 40 in 2.3 seconds? And I can run for, you know, in soccer, we run constantly for oh, like 10 days on end without sleep. Would that be something beneficial to somebody in the NFL? Yeah, it would be. But you're making the connections for me. You're not making me work for you. I'm communicating my value. I'm communicating the skills that I have in your terms so that you see the value. I make the connectivity for you. Does that make sense? That's what you've got to do with your jobs. The problem is, without having worked in the industry, how do you do that? A lot of people that I talk to, the only thing that they've ever done is, you know, they've worked in bars, they've worked in restaurants, they've sold clothes. Well, that's not an engineering job. So what? Nothing? Oh, my job as a server in the restaurant was I was the front line of customer contact for the entire company. I quickly assessed what the problem was with the customer, helped them find exactly what they wanted. I communicated constantly and effectively with them what was going on in the kitchen, took care of them the whole time so that I could help ensure that they were not only a repeat customer for the business, but they asked for me specifically. Does that sound like something you could use, Mr. Employee? Hell yeah! But you're not making me work for you. You're not making me create those contacts. You're spelling them out for me. But if you don't know what you can do and you can't translate that, you're starting off at a disadvantage. Does that make sense? Are you seeing how this is working? You see how much of this comes into play ahead of time before you get ready. You kind of take a lot of time to understand the product that you're selling and what you can do with that product going forward. From the perspective of the employer, this is what a lot of people don't understand. Only thing I need you to do is show up on time, sober, ready to work every single day. Teaching you the job is the easiest thing in the world. In fact, it's required because every engineering company is going to teach you how to become an engineer in a slightly different way. Every environmental company is going to teach you how to become an environmental scientist in a slightly different way, their way. Teaching you the job is easy, but I can't teach you to show up on time, ready to meet the timely responsibility of your job. I can't teach you to show up sober, clear-headed, focused on helping me make money, ready to work, ready to put in the overtime, ready to work the weekends, ready to do whatever it takes to get the job done. you got to bring that from here. And there's no government training program out there that's going to teach you how to do that. You've got to find this and communicate this to me. The rest of it's easy. I'll teach you the job. Show me you can sew up on time so we're ready to work every single day. And we've got a communication uh, started already. Now, the other thing we got to do is understand customer needs and understand why the customer is buying. You know, i got a quick question. It's not really a trick question. You're in a Harley shop. A middle-aged man comes in that's never ridden a motorcycle in his life, wants to buy a Harley. What's he wanting to buy? Image. Clothes. Yeah. Which image is he wanting to buy? The one that he sees on TV and things like that. Like Clothes. Free spirit. That made him feel like he was 21 again. There you go. He's buying his youth again. 
He's buying the image he had when he was 20. That's what he, that's what he wants. Now, if I'm trying to sell him that Harley, do I talk to him about gas mileage? Do I talk to him about the fine Corinthian leather that the seat's made from? No, he doesn't care about that stuff. How do you sell a Harley to a middle-aged man that's never had a motorcycle? This thing goes zero to 100 and no, 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 he doesn't care about that. Give him a test drive. No, no. There you go. You're going to turn some heads on this. Have them sit on it. If you're really smart, have some woman come in from the back and do the double take and go, wow, that color, oh, God, oh, that's incredible. You look plain. Is your hair darker when you sit on that? Oh, my God. You look hot on that bike. That's all it takes. Oh, I'll take two of them. But you got to understand the customer's needs. If a 20-year-old comes in to buy a Ducati, the fastest production motorcycle on the planet, are you, is he buying his youth? No. It's a completely different market, it's a completely different buy. Right? Okay? you got to understand why they're buying. Why is this job open? What, what is driving the company to need to fill this position? Do you think that would be information that would be valuable for you to know? Is it impossible to find out? No. That's why LinkedIn's good. You can go and find people in the company and ask them questions about that. You can know, you do some research on your own about what's going on in this market, whichever market it is you're applying for, and finding out what's making them need to expand. Because nobody hires somebody, you know, we got a couple thousand dollars laying around. We don't know what to do with You want to hire some people? No, that never happens. I don't want any employees. But I can't seem to make money without a few of them. So I'm only going to hire them if they're going to make me money. Something's driving it. Something related to money is driving it. If you know what that is, it helps you sell what you can do better to that employer. Does that make sense? All right. When I, I was a general manager of Daphne Utilities for about 10 years, when I went to interview with them, it's important to know the business that you're interviewing with, just like we talked about knowing the customer. Now, it's a water, wastewater, natural gas utility. What do I want to know about water, wastewater, natural gas? As much as you can. About what? All. About What's what? going on in the market right now? You know, how much you make? How much you know? Each how they make money? Them. Or what keeps them from making money? Which is really <laughs> the same thing. Okay. <laughs> when do you make money? It's very simple. When do you make money in the water business? When do you sell water? Well, turn on the tap. No, like the time of year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Summer. Oh, summer. Summer. Okay. When do you make money in the natural gas business? Winter. Winter. When do you make money in the wastewater business? All the time. That's what it's so great about. Everybody's got to go, and it's got to go somewhere. Okay? That's what's so great about it. Now, knowing information about that, knowing what regulations are coming down the pipe that are going to double the price of wastewater in the next five years, would that be good information to know? If I was applying to work at a wastewater utility? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Is knowing who the chairman of the board in 1953 was good information to know? No. Don't look up trivia about the company. Don't look up all of that. I hear you're expanding in Shanghai. Are you going to go to Shanghai and work? No. Useful, relevant information to the position you're applying for in the part of the company that you're going to work. If you're going to work in a software part of the company, you don't talk to them about the cars that they're making because that's not related to what you're doing. Does that make sense? Know the company, know the business, know how they make money, how you can help them make money. Now, this is the most common way that people in the job market look for a job these days. This is the monster.com job strategy where if I send 100 resumes, Oh, better yet, 500, wait, better yet, 1,000 resumes out to 1,000 different jobs that I don't know anything about. Somehow I feel like I'm accomplishing something. Am I accomplishing anything? It's about as effective as hunting ducks by just taking a shotgun and firing it in the air and hoping a duck flies over at that precise moment in time. How many of y'all want to count on that to put food on the table? Anybody? No. This is what you ought to be doing. It's better to find two or three jobs 
that you study, you know the industry, you know the job, you know why the job's open, you know the employer, you better know the person that's running, that's gonna be actually doing the hiring, hiring the manager themselves. What's driving their decision? Spend a lot of time hunting two or three jobs, you'll be significantly better off than blindly getting on monster.com and sending in a thousand job applications to positions and companies you don't know anything about whatsoever. Because then if you do get a call, what are you going to do with that? Then you're going to have to start then. Well, we would like you to come in Thursday for an interview. There's not enough time. Learn what you can about it. Apply to the jobs you know something about. All right. Talking about the call coming in, when the call comes in, you need to be ready for it because you don't know when it's going to happen. When there's a job open, we want to get it filled quickly. Because the only time we're looking for people is when we're in a bind and we have to have them. And that's one of the problems from the employer's perspective is I don't want to just hire a bunch of bozos. I want to hold out for the right person, but it's pain for my organization every minute that there's an open position at my company. So I want to fill it fast. So I'm going to call you up and I'm probably going to get you to come in for an interview fast. Think about all the movies you've seen about, you know, the young couple having the first baby and they're totally unprepared and the woman comes in, honey, I think it's time. And the guy just freaks out and gets a bowling ball and some swim fins and a can of cheese whiz and puts it in a suitcase and they run off to the car to head to the hospital. They don't know where the, oh, where the, uh, what, what hospital? That's how we end up going to job interviews. We're totally unprepared. You need to get everything out ready. Get your resumes printed up ahead of time, not the morning before you go. I did this one time, I had a job interview scheduled and I was gonna get up in the morning and just print them out then. And I said, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna print them out tonight. And that's when I found out my toner cartridge was out and I was leaving white streaks down the whole page. And I'm glad I freaked out the night before and had time to go get some new toner cartridge. You know, that suit that you're going to wear in the interview, the one you look killer in last summer before you gained 20 pounds, you know? That dress that fit you like a glove last spring before you went on your diet and lost 30 pounds? What does it look like now? Get the stuff out, try it on, have some, you know, do the whole turnaround, have somebody check it out, make sure you don't have a hole ripped in the crotch that you don't know about. Check it out. There's no stain on the back that you've never seen because I don't ever see the back of my jacket. Check it all out. Make sure everything looks good. Make sure your shoes look good. Everything. That makes sense. Check it out ahead of time. Check out everything about going to that interview. How long does it take to get from your house to where you're going to do the interview? Would it be smart to drive there Sunday afternoon and expect that to be the same amount of time it takes there to get there at 8.30 Monday morning. You see what I mean? Check it out ahead of time. When you get there, where are you going to park? Oh, on Sunday afternoon, there's plenty of places open in that parking garage right across the street. On Monday morning, that thing is slam full. Now where are you going to park? When you get in that parking garage, how are you going to pay for it? I don't know about you, I don't carry money. I carry plastic. And on more than one occasion, I've gotten into a parking garage that only takes cash to get out. Go, well, what am I going to do? You're going to go get some cash and bring me some cash. That's what you're going to do. And they're kind of rude about it. They can be. What are they going to do? I'm not, not going to ram this. It's like Manix. It's not Hawaii 5.0. I'm not going to ram the barricade and get out. I'm going to go park my car again and go find some money. What about a parking meter? Do you even carry coins with you? Do you think you should? This is what it's about being prepared, having everything ready. Keep some money in your car, keep some coins in your car. You don't know where you're going to be able to park. But check it out ahead of time. Try it out preferably under the conditions that you're going to go to on the job interview during a business day. Now, what you need to bring to the interview is you dress properly. What does properly mean? Professional. Professional. Yep. That's all it means. Whatever professional means. It's different for different places, but what I want to tell you is it's a game we're playing. There's things you can do that can't help you, but could hurt you. It's like going to Vegas. If there's a game that you can play where if you win, you get nothing, 
but if you lose, they take all your money, would you play that game? There's a lot of this going on in the job interview. Go with the tried and true vet, the one that can't hurt you. Men, that's a suit. Women, that's a pantsuit or a dress. Conservative, conservative, conservative. You don't want to be the guy in the shiny green suit. Okay? You don't want to be the, oh, the girl that came by for the interview on the way to go clubbing with the mini dress and the, the knee-high leather boots with the stiletto heels. Oh, yeah, that one. You don't want to be the one remembered by what they wore. Go for the middle of the road, dull, dark suit, dark pants suit. Wear what you would wear if you were going to go out with the client, go out with the owner of the company to meet a new client. That's just a little swing dog. Like, that makes sense. Conservative, conservative, conservative. It's not time to be fashion four. Okay? Uh, let me give you an example. I'm a, I'm a pocket square guy. Okay, I love pocket squares. This is as wild and out there as I'll go on a job interview. Okay? I will, I've got hundreds. And I love them. I don't know why, I just do. But this is too frou-frou for a job interview, okay? It's small, but I might just run into the guy that just thinks that's out there and doesn't like it, okay? That makes sense. Just conservative, 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 down the middle. Minimum, minimum, minimum jewelry. You can wear a class ring. If you're married, wear a band. You can wear a watch. Wear a simple watch. I know the style is to take a wall clock and put a strap on it and wear it on your wrist right now. Just get a small, simple, don't spend a lot of money. Get a Timex. Uh, there's one of my favorite watches is out of India. It's on HMT. You can get it for $9 on eBay. Free shipping. And they look cool. Simple, simple, simple. Not the watch. Not glittery. Not studded. Not something I'm going to remember. Just something to tell time with. Uh, no, tats are cool. I got tats. I'm not saying anything about tats. If you've got tats that I can see, is that going to help you get a job? Well, if you're applying for a job at Hot Topic, yes. Anywhere else, no. Okay? It, could it cost you the job? Yeah. Play the odds. Cover them up. Either wear something that covers them up, or they've got makeup that will cover them. you got tats on your neck, cool as hell, put some stuff on where I don't see them. Wear it until you've established yourself at that place of business, and then you can slowly reveal, oh, it's Johnny that's so good with accounts. Oh, I didn't know he had tats. Oh, that's kind of cool. It's introducing them in a completely different environment. That makes sense. Okay? Uh, no non-conservative piercings. Again, it's the style. I think it's cool. My daughter has, I think, 17 studs in her ear. I don't have a problem with it, but if she goes to a job interview, I hope she takes them out. I, true story, I interviewed a guy one time. He's got the big hoop earring in his lip. And I'm just going, okay, I'm just before we get started, this is a really conservative place. Nobody here has a big hoop. Oh, oh, no problem, no problem. <laughs> he takes it out and he puts it on the table in a pool of its own juices. So what am I staring at for the entire interview? Did he get the job off? No. Leave him at home, okay? They're not going to help you. They can hurt you. Don't do anything that can't help you but could hurt you. All right? You want to be the one to remember, not what you were wearing. Again, if you want to think about something, pretend you're going out with the boss to meet a potential client. What would you be wearing then? And unless you're going clubbing, it wouldn't be club wear. Okay? Think about that. Uh, bring an ID. Particularly if you're applying for a government job, you're not going to get through the door. Uh, you have to have an ID going forward. Um, some type of folder. This is what I want you to get. You know what this is? A couple bucks. Hmm? A couple dollars. Five Twelve bucks at Walmart. Don't spend a lot of money on it. I've got one that's bomber jacket, brown leather. I've had it for ages. It's big. And it, but it doesn't do this. This is what you want it to do. Fold back. You can write on it. It's got a place for a pen. It's got a place to put your extra copies of your resume. Business cards, this is all you need. Fold flat, lays flat, no clasp mechanism, no locking. I'm not, nobody's going to steal your notes out of it, okay? 
It's just a thing to hold resume. Five extra copies at a minimum. It would be better if you carried ten. Why is that? Panel interviews. Panel interviews. HR never remembers to make enough copies of your resume. If you go into a panel interview and they go, oh, oh, uh, I didn't get, uh, oh, no, don't worry. Here, I've got extra copies. Here you go. Does that look prepared? After the job interview, they say, well, we might need to check your references. Oh, oh, here, I've got a copy of my references right here. Does that make you look prepared? That's what it's about. It's making you look prepared constantly going forward. Okay? Professional looking pen. Here, we got to check this out now. Is this a professional looking pen? No? A little plastic thing like that? Uh, is this a professional looking pen? Yeah, it's a hundred dollar mop block. What happens when I take the top off? Oh, oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm going under your desk to get the top of my hundred dollar mop block. And, uh, you know, there's probably jobs where going under the interviewer's desk <laughs> helps you get the job. I don't want to talk about any of those, okay? Don't carry an expensive pen when the top that comes off. This is what I want you to go find. You know what this is? What does it look like? Government issue. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> Looks like a cross pen, okay? Which can cost 100 bucks. This is from Hyatt. This is what they give away free at a conference. Steal a pen. Again, free is the operative word. It's plastic, but I took a black Sharpie and I blacked out Hyatt.com on the side of it, and now it's my interview pen. It looks, it's conservative. There's no top to come off. It's a twist turn. That's a professional looking pen that won't get you in trouble. Make sense? Where'd my puncher go? My daughter hates it when I call my puncher. Uh, single car key. Uh, most men dream of becoming a janitor. That's why we never throw away any key that we are ever given our entire life. And what happens is you got your keys in your pocket and you get nervous and it's like you're trying to break into the Macarena at any moment. You got a little maracas, pocket maracas going. No, all you need to do is get back in your car, get your fob, get one key, and you can put that in your jacket pocket and it won't stick out. You can stick in a pocket here, it won't puff out on your leg or anything like that. What did I do? There. One key, that's all you need to do is get back in your car. Let's talk about a wallet too. Oh wait, that's gonna Pocket change, same thing, pocket maracas. Tic-tac, the same way, don't carry that in there. Uh, purse and wallets. This again, this is the same thing with the man. For some reason, we don't throw anything away. I might need a pack of sugar, so I'm gonna keep it in my wallet, you know? And so we carry around these big honking things, and when you put them in your pot, your jacket, Makes you look like you're lopsided or something like that. Okay? Don't do that. All you need is your driver's license. And if you want to put that, you don't want to carry a driver's license, just put your driver's license in your pocket. If you get a wallet, just get something that holds just it. Take all the extra stuff out. All the receipts you've been collecting for six months, take all those out. Just a thin, thin, thin little wallet. No, oh, purse. Let's talk about the purse real quick. Um, is the purse going to help you get the job? Can it keep you from getting the job? How? Well, it can be distracting. It could be really big and ugly, right? My wife, if there's a zombie apocalypse, if I can get to my wife's purse, I will be safe. Because everything needed to sustain life is in that thing. Okay? A interview is a professional meeting. You don't take your purse to a professional meeting. It's not needed. There's nothing that's going to go on there that's needed. It can't help you, but what happened? Where do you put it? You got this huge duffel bag thing. Where are you going to put it? On the interviewer's desk? Are you trying to look around it while you're sitting in a chair across the desk? Oh, I'm going to sit it on the side of the desk and it flops over and everything comes out. And now I'm on my hands and knees because I'm trying to be polite, helping you pick up stuff. And then I realize I've got a handful of your feminine products in my hand. Ah! Is that going to help you get a job? Don't, let, don't take it. Leave it in the car. It's not going to help you. Don't do anything that can only hurt you going forward. Make sense? All right. This should be obvious. There's no point in the interview where you're going to stop for a skull break or a smoke break or e-cig or anything like that. Leave all that in the car. Sunglasses. This is a trick question. Where is the proper place for your sunglasses during a job interview? 
The car. In the car. A. <laughs> B. C. D. Or E. Hung on a string around your neck. Because I've interviewed somebody doing all of them. How many of them did I hire? None. None. Where is the proper place? Car. Car. It's not that bright. And leave your fear in the car. You don't need that at all as well. Go in there confident. It's your time. You know the subject matter. Go in there confident. Okay? Now, we're finally to the job interview. See what all it took just to get ready to go to the job interview? Now we're here. Uh, who is this? Receptions. No. Who is this? The first interviewer. That's the initial contact for the company to you. Who is this? That's an idiot. Okay? Would you go into the interviewer's office and go, hey, how you doing? No? Then don't do it to this person in HR. Okay? It's rude. What's this Kirby thing here? That's her desk again. Hey, how you doing? No, you wouldn't do it with the interviewer. Don't do it with this person. They're interviewing you the same way. Be professional with them. You've got your business card. Hello. Rob Macker, I'm here to see Miss Smith. Here's my card. Thank you very much. Don't get testy with them. Have you found her yet? My interview is supposed to start in five minutes. What did you just do? Shot your interview to hell. Okay? Understand that part of it. Make sense? It's not a time to pick up a date. It's time to get a job. Okay? First impressions. When do you make your first impression? First. Huh? First. When is that? First 10 seconds. When is that? When you walk in the door. Maybe. Or when you walk in the office. Maybe. Maybe. You don't know. Maybe. You don't know when that first impression looks like. I'm a headbanger. So I'm driving to the interview with Godsmack going like hell, because that's my favorite band right now. Or gangster rap or whatever with a trunk lid going boom, 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 boom. Who's parked next to me at the red line? <laughs> HR. I'm texting while I'm driving, and I just slightly tap the person in front of me. Who did I just slightly tap? HR. I cut off somebody. Somebody cuts me off. It's like, Aah! who was it? HR. HR. And I got there late, can't find a parking place, so, you know, there's plenty of handicapped places. Guess who is handicapped at the business? HR. HR. And that's their normal place. I would start at your house, I would put a smile <laughs> on my face, and I would turn the radio way down, I would drive under the speed limit. You don't know when that first impression is made. You don't get to decide when the first impression is made. Somebody else does. Because you don't know when it happens. It's whatever they see, but you don't know when it happens. Does that make sense? All right. You got to be on your best behavior. Smile, because most of us in hard sciences have a problem with this. I'm an engineer. I don't know why. I'm a happy guy, but when I'm in business mode, all the emotion falls out of my face, and, I'm, and I look angry. I don't mean to look angry, but I need to learn to smile. So I, I do this. <laughs> Would this creep you out? Yeah. Get in front of a mirror and figure out a smile. Everybody's got a couple that they can pull off. Figure out one that works for you. And look at it for a while. You need to practice your smile. You need to be aware of it. It's a friendly smile. It's not the joker. Okay? A friendly smile. Work on it. Especially if you know you need help with it. 
Handshakes. This is one of the few things where a great handshake will benefit a woman when it won't benefit a man. Because like it or not, a man's expected to have a decent handshake. And a woman's not. So a woman have an advantage in this regard if you know how to do a proper professional handshake. Webbing of the hand, touches webbing of the hand before you close, twice, and let go. That's it. You're not the queen. I, you know, don't give me your <laughs> fingertips. Don't show me that you used to be an East German prison guard. Okay? It's just a professional handshake. Hey. That's all it is, but practice it with your friends. Trust me, a, a great handshake, and, and oh my God, if you're a man, you, have, you know, this is what liver feels like. <laughs> you know, oh my God, oh, it's just creepy. But again, it, it's, it's just a weird thing with male interviewers that it, it'll be the first way I remember every woman that I've ever shook hands with, wow, that's a good handshake. It just sticks out, and I don't know why it is. Like I said, it's a great way for you to make a great first impression that Gives you an advantage over a man going into it. Be engaging, it's okay to laugh. And I talked to uh, Dr. Berman this morning, it's one of the things that, for some reason, I mean, I'm in, from Alabama. You know, the great rivalry in Alabama is Alabama and Auburn. And in, uh, in every interview I've ever been with, I always managed to work in, well, actually, I'm a half breed. My dad graduated from Auburn, my mom graduated from Alabama, and I'm actually an expert in conflict for resolution as a result. And you know, it's not, oh, this rabbi and a nurse and goes into a bar with a duck on the head. It's not telling a joke, but it's being okay to laugh. It's being comfortable enough when things come up that you can be lighthearted. And if you can get somebody to chuckle with you, that's good, okay? Don't tell jokes, but it's okay. It doesn't have to all be serious. Does that make sense? Uh, answer the question. This is a remarkable one. People, get advice from these uh, professional columns in the paper and magazines all the time saying, oh, here's how to avoid questions you don't want to answer. Well, let me just give you an example. Uh, Mr. McElroy, what's your favorite color? Oh, there are many colors out there. There are colors that can make things look large and colors that can make things look small. Some colors can make things look hot and some can make it look cool. And colors can impact our mood and all kinds. And in conclusion, I, there are many, many colors. Now, you are all completely fooled that I didn't answer the question, right? No? I know what I asked. And I know when you're dodging it. And the only conclusion I can come up with is there must be a really good reason why you're refusing to answer that question. It's probably something that says horrible things about you. Just answer the question. Here's the corollary of that. What's this? This is the most comforting thought on the planet when I ask you a question you don't want to answer. What was your GPA? Well, have you ever been tired? Well, just answer the question. What was your GPA? My GPA was 2.89. I really wish it had been more. I worked my way through school. That's why it took me five years to get out, but I stayed committed. I got my degree, I paid off all my student loans successfully, and when I went back for my MBA, I had straight four O's in my MBA courses. Right now, I've got a 3.1. Do I have any more questions about that? Have you ever been fired? Yes, I've been fired. Uh, actually, a good friend of mine fired me. We had a disagreement about policy. She was wrong, right? I was wrong. She did the right thing, even though we were very close friends, she let me go. To this day, every time I see her, I thank her for showing me what good management's all about. Do you have any more questions about why I was fired? No. I, look, I'm not going to go on a crusade with you to right some wrong in your past. I don't want to hear a long, drawn-out story. Just answer the question and move on. Put the caveat afterwards if you want, but answer the question up front, and then give me whatever caveat you want afterwards. Make sense? All right. Questions you're going to likely get, tell me about yourself. You ought to be able to wing this one, right? No, you need to practice it. Memorize something if you have to, but don't deliver it as a memorized speech. Where am I? Oh, good. 
people get up and start running from the room. We're so sorry. We have uh, a presentation from our office in another building. No problem. So, but we didn't want to miss no this. This is fantastic. Thank, Thank you for so coming. Much. Oh, and in case you guys haven't met our um, oh. <laughs> career services staff, Alicia gave the seminar last month in September. She's our career services rep. And um, Jean is the director of career services. Thank Very you. Nice so to listen to everything he said because he was right on. <laughs> Not that you needed my endorsement, but hey, great job. All right, tell me about yourself. This needs to be, what, two or three minutes? You need to know what you're going to say about this. I was born and raised in Mobile, Alabama. My mother was a school teacher. My father was an engineer. They taught me. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> I was just thinking, do you give them any personal information? Like, how far back do you go with tell me about yourself? I would go from as fast as you could. You know, born and raised here. This is what my, my parents taught me to work hard and tell the truth my entire life. As I was going through high school, I was continually noted for my leadership ability. The Navy sought me out for the Navy nuclear program. That was not something I wanted to do. But when I got to college, the Army sought me out for ROTC and I got my commission through the military through ROTC while I was in college. I went on, I served my country proudly, I got out, I've been working in consulting for a few years. Uh, again, I was noted for my leadership ability there, leading several successful projects in Mississippi and Alabama, and even one into the former West Germany. And that brings me to today, where I'm here to talk to you about your opening and your opportunities here. That's, that's about all it You don't focus on like pets and favorite colors, no, no, where you've no. traveled. Okay, so no, I've heard it's it all. all what what right. was the recurring thing? Leadership. leadership. Does that tie to the employer? That's what they want to hear about. They don't want to hear about my cat. I'm a cat person. Okay. They don't want to hear about my cat. I'll show them pictures of my cat, but they don't want to hear about that. Okay? Focus. That's why it needs to be custom written for everyone you go to. You need to have one that you can slightly go in slightly different directions, depending on what the job is and what they're looking for. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, the other, why do you want to work here? Again, this should be a throwaway, but what people most often do is throw it away. This is the first opportunity to impress them with what you know about the company. The answer I hear more often than not is, oh, I just need a job. <laughs> Which is about as useful as proposing to a woman and having her go, oh my, why do you want me to be your wife? Oh, I, I, she could be my wife, or, or you could be my wife, but I don't care, I just need a wife. Is that flattering? No, as an employer, I just I, I don't care, I'll work for you, or you, or you, I, don't, I just need a job. No, it's about demonstrating for them that you know something about job. Oh, wow, I've been studying what's going on at Agnico for more than five years. In fact, I've been watching it and reading about it in the Wall Street Journal, and I hear you're doing this expansion in this area and this area, and the work you're doing with bio, blah, 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 is fascinating to me. I'm really hoping that that's something I can work with you. And it happens to be, the thing I'm most fascinating with, happens to align perfectly with the job opening that I'm applying for. Do you see the connectivity? It's the first chance to knock one out of the block about knowing something about the company. Again, it takes preparation. You're not going to go in there and wing it. And you're not going to read the corporate literature in the waiting room while you're waiting to go back to meet the interviewing manager and find out this kind of information. Does that make sense? Don't volunteer personal details about yourself that you would be upset if I asked them of you. Does your husband have cancer? Have you missed any house notes? Is your mother bipolar? Are your kids acting up and one of them's on drugs? Would you get upset if I asked you that in an interview? I have had people volunteer all of that to me during the interview. I need a job. We're going to lose our house. My husband. It just makes me uncomfortable. How many job offers do you get from people you make uncomfortable? Zero. Don't volunteer anything about yourself that you would be upset if somebody asked it of you. That makes sense. Okay. Again, I you know what you need is not my problem. What is my problem? What you need. I need to make money. That'll give me a bonus. If you can help me do that, we got something to talk about. Anything else? I. That's your problem, not mine. 
All right, what I do want to talk about is your accomplishments. Now, you meet me at a party. Hey, Rob, what do you do for a living? I'm a movie director. What's your next question? What movies? Well, uh, what am I now? A director that has money. Big old loser. Uh, or a liar. One. What I want to talk to you about your accomplishments. What, if, what can you do and what have you done with those skills? That's what I want to talk to you about. And you better be able to connect what you've been able to accomplish with something I need you to do. Remember that we talked about transferable skills. Translate what you've done into something that might be of value to me. Now, the question will come all kinds of different ways. This is the way I ask it when I give an interview. At Agmico, we often deal with Blank. I just make a list of the things, the problems we have, and then I fill in the blank. Tell me about a time when you dealt with blank and how you handled it. Sometimes you'll just hear it. Tell me about a time you dealt with blank. Period. Okay. You need to know your resume first and foremost because that's the easiest place for me to pull questions from. Tell me. Oh, I see you were involved with this. Tell me something about this. Tell me about a conversation with this. That's the first thing that. You need to be studying every aspect. If you don't have a good story about almost every word you put on your resume, don't put it on your resume. Spend the time to develop something about that. This is how the question comes up. This is a good format for the answers. Give them the results up front. Expand upon it afterwards. Do it in such a way that I can picture you sitting at the table doing the activity physically and then wrap up with the recap of the results at the end. Uh, tell, me about, tell me about an event you successfully planned. Tell me about a project you successfully accomplished. Oh, I organized my fraternity's winter formal. One time on budget was considered one of the best ones that we've ever thrown. Let me give you a little background on this. As I studied how to put on a winter formal, I knew that the three most important things were gonna be the venue and the entertainment and the food. I approached each one of these by doing this. Blah, 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 blah. You see how organized that is? And that's how I organized the most successful winter formal in my fraternity's history on time, on budget. Does that sound good? You can do the same format with everything. Certainly everything you've got on your resume needs to have an answer formulated in this way. But it's a very organized way to present your data that shows you know how to organize for problem solving. That's at the end of the day, that's what I need you to do is solve my problems for. Okay? That makes sense. Weaknesses. This is not a time to expose some fatal flaw. I think I've got that internet porn addiction under control finally. Oh, this is six weeks alcohol free at my last AA meeting. You know, that's not what I want to hear about you. You know, it, don't share something that I'm really not going to be able to handle well, okay? Even if you think it's great. A weakness is, could be, if you've got five things you do really well, the fifth one you do well might be your weakness. Or it might be the thing you do the best, but it's run amok. My answer is, my weakness is I'm a problem solver. And where that manifests itself is when people come to me with problems, I know the answers to them. But I know if I just spoon feed them the answers, they're never going to learn how to solve problems on their own. So I have to restrain myself constantly from just handing out easy answers to people that come to me for help and help them instead learn a way to problem solve that helps them grow so that they become better managers themselves. That's my answer. Do you, does it expose anything fatal about me? No. Is it a fake answer? Oh, I'm just, I work too hard. No, you don't. <laughs> don't give some stupid answer that just ticks me off, okay? Don't read something out of a book and repeat it to me. I, look, I've read the same books, too. I know the answers that are in the book. I want to hear your answers. Don't give me crap from the book, okay? Now, 
We'll get around and talk about money. Okay, Mr. McElroy, what kind of money are you looking for? This is where it gets really, really dangerous. And this is the only way I want you to answer this question the first time. At this point, I am much more concerned about you determining whether or not I'm the absolutely best candidate for this position. If you determine that I am, I'm absolutely confident that you and I are going to come to an agreement on a compensation package that's going to make both of us very, very happy. Who did I put first? The company. The company. Do you understand why? Does that make sense? Does that feel better than I want to make 50? I got to make 50. Yes? Could you repeat that? It's on the notes. Did you get a note page? No. Okay, it's on the notes. Isn't it? Okay, it's on the note page. Um, but that's the feel of it is at this point, I am much more concerned about helping you determine if I'm the absolutely best candidate for this job. And if you feel that I am, I'm confident that you and I are going to come to an agreement on a compensation package that makes both of us very happy. Okay, great answer, Ms. McElroy, but seriously, what do you need? Again, we're right back to this preparation point because what should you have done before you come into the job? Research the job. That's what happens when you graph any job anywhere. You get a bell curve. There are some people making more. There's some people making less at both ends. Where do we want to be? No, you're lying through your teeth. Where do you want to be? You want to be this. I, I might be willing to accept 65, 400. <laughs> that's where we come across because we think we're the greatest thing since sliced bread what you got to understand is in the real world there are ranges I hate it when jobs are posted with no range on them because there's so many jobs an engineer is the worst I can tell you that you know try to go out and call somebody a sanitation doctor or a sanitation lawyer without passing the bar or without going to medical school and see if you don't get sued but you can call yourself a sanitation engineer and be a janitor Okay? Nobody gives a range, so you don't really know what they're looking for. It's tough. That's what you got to do the research. Where do you go to find how to make, how much a job should be paid? Labor? Google. What? Glass door. Glass door. What else? Google. Google. Salary survey, salary.com. There's lots of them out there. Just go out and hunt for a bunch of them and figure out what the range of them. The best of them will give you this bell curve. And most people make this. Does that mean that's what you should be making when you start the job? As an entry level, where should you be? I'm sorry. You should probably be down here on the end as an entry level worker. That's what you should expect. When they ask you for a, a specific job, only talk about it in ranges and talk about it in this way. My understanding of job duties and responsibilities of this position would lead me to believe that it warrants a salary range of 42 to 48,000. And if they go, oh, I'm sorry, this is a $90,000 job. Oh, well then let's discuss what the job duties and responsibilities are because I've obviously missed something. You can recover from that. It's okay. If they go, oh, no, this is a $20,000 job. Oh, I'm sorry. I really envision this being significantly more responsible than it appears that you have in place. I, I apologize. Can we talk about something else? Is there someplace else in your organization where my skills and responsibilities could be put to good use? Because they're only going to be talking about money when they decided you're the kind of person they want. And it's kind of like going to a car lot. You know, you, you don't lead, if you're trying to sell somebody a Corvette, you don't lead with, here's a Corvette and it's 89,000 bucks. No, you let them fall in love with it to the point they can't live without it, and then you begrudgingly go, oh yeah, it's 89,000. But you got them on the hook at that point. Does that make sense? Yes? What if there is a salary range listed and then they ask you, should you go towards, like say you're starting out, should you maybe stay towards the lower end of their range or the higher end? Great question. Let me give you an answer that you're not going to like. Everybody wants to peg out the top of their range. The problem comes in when you don't think long term about your career. 
Because the most important thing about your long-term career is the first evaluation you get to. Let's say you got a range of 40 to 50, and you hold out and manage to get 50. You do an incredible job that first year in service. Comes up to evaluation, you get an incredible evaluation. What kind of pay raise do you get? None. <coughs> does the boss look at the evaluations? No. What does he look at? How much you're making. He cares about the bottom line. So if anything, he'll look at the list of names of who's employed and what kind of pay raise they got. Wow. I always thought McElroy was doing pretty good, but I, I see he didn't get any pay rate. He must have really screwed some up this year. I was thinking about getting him on this other project, but I don't know if he screwed something up. Maybe I, maybe I better not. You see the problem. It's better to go in low and get you a real good, plus the fact that you suck at negotiations. You have nothing to negotiate. You don't have any skills. You don't have any performance in the field. You don't have any experience. Whatever they offer you, there's, there's no person out there that can pay 90, but you inadvertently say you'll take 30, and they go, oh, wow, we screwed them out of 60 grand. No, it's just not the way HR works. They've got a range they've got to pay in, and they're going to pay it. Most of the time, it's going to be on the low end. At the university I worked at, it was required that you all offers came in at the lowest dollar available. And if you found an exceptional person, you could offer them 10% above the minimum if you could get two vice presidents of the university to sign off on it. How many people got more than the minimum coming in the door? Very, very few. You see the problem with that. Don't be so concerned about it. You'll make it up on time quickly if you'll just go in and be ready to play ball with whatever they offer you. Don't negotiate. You just don't have anything to negotiate with. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you need to ask some questions. Every time you go into a job interview, you will ask questions. Does anybody know what the questions are? The questions are, in front of your cheat sheet, the questions that make the employer stop and think and respond in terms of you. As your new team leader, can you tell me about the team I'll be leading? As your new and civil engineer, can you tell me what clients you'll have me working with first? As your new manager, can you tell me the number one problem you'd like me to tackle first for your company? Do you see what I'm doing? I cannot answer that question without envisioning you in my head already working for my company and thinking about what you're going to do for me. And then once you hear that, this is why it's so important to know what you can do. Listen carefully and be able to think on your feet. You've got to respond in terms of you. Uh, I think we'll have you, we've got a big opening in Pulp and Paper, we'll probably have you working with Acme paper board. Oh, that's fascinating. When I was in college, I ran the recycling program, and I know that paper board is, uh, recycled paper is the number one uh, raw material for the paper board industry. I'm going to love working in that industry. You see how that works? Ask the question that makes them envision you already working for them, and then be able to follow up on it in any way you can. That's why you've got to know your resume forwards and backwards, and know what skills you have and have already thought about some of these things. Okay? The one key question you need to ask is about the timeline. Can you give me a little bit of information about the timeline moving forward with this hire? This is critical because they're going to tell you. There's no, no reason not to. We're going to be interviewing for another two weeks. We're going to bring people back in early November for a second round of interviews. And we're hoping to have this position filled by December 1st. The reason that that's clear, that's key for you to know, is there is a very key mental transition that's happening. While I'm interviewing, I'm just looking at candidates, looking at candidates, looking at candidates, but I'm not calling out anybody yet. Then there's this magical moment, right when I've interviewed the last candidate, now I've got to shift my focus and say, who do we want to bring back for a second round? Or, that was the second round, okay, who do we want to hire? And that's a complete change in mental focus on the problem. What you want to do is to send, you know, pick up the phone and call HR or call the interviewer and just say, hey, Tom, it's uh, Rob. I just wanted to remind you that I had a great time with the interview, fascinating information about what's going on at Acme Firm. 
I'm enthusiastic about the possibilities. I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks so much. Just short and sweet. Drop them an email, maybe two sentences. Just want to let you know my continued interest in the job at Acmeco. Thanks, have a great day. If there's anything I can do to answer any questions you might have, feel free to call me. Just nothing but a short, sweet reminder that you exist. Just shove, their, shove your name right in front of their nose at that key point in time. Does that make sense? All right. Oh, this is the key point. What happens when you're interviewing with five different jobs and you've got all this information? What do you need to do with it? Put it on your calendar as an event. Because if you're interviewing with five different people and every one of them are telling you, this is when the interviews are ending and we're going to transition to second round and this is when we're going to make hiring decisions, are you going to remember when all those dates are? No. So make it an event and put all that contact information on that event calendar. Call Kelly at USF about reference environmental scientist one job interviewed on, you know, go ahead and put notes in there, drag and drop them into a calendar, okay? Because you want to reference it. I interviewed with you on August 3rd with Dr. Smith. Be able to reference something that makes them remember you, okay? When you get to the car before you even leave, document everything that you learned about the company from that. If you were in a panel interview, you know, get, get business cards from everybody. What I do when I get to a panel interview, I get business cards for everybody and I put them on the table in front of me exactly like they were sitting around the table. So as I'm talking to them, I can go, yes, Mr. Smith, and oh, uh, Dr. Laird, you know, and Tom, and I've, I've got a little cheat sheet here. When you get to your car, draw you a little circle and put the names on it, because you can still vision them, envision them in your head, sitting around that table, and you want to be able to remember what it is. Document what specific problems they brought to bear to the interview. Well, then, you know, some people will be focused on money, the finance manager will be focused on money. Some people will be focused on just personnel issues. Some people will be focused on technical issues. But everybody comes to it from a completely different perspective. And it'd be good to have a little note down about what specific questions they were asking. So that if you go back to a second interview, or you want to write that specific person a thank you letter, you can kind of casually reference it. During our interview, you expressed interest in getting rates at the utility up over time so we could cover our capital costs. I agree with you, blah, 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 blah. It's a way you can tie yourself to that person. That makes sense. Um, write down everything, including your follow-up schedule. This is the most important thing. You're not going to remember what those are. Always, 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 always write a thank you letter. It doesn't have to be long. It can be handwritten. It can be typed. It can be an email too, but I wouldn't make it just an email, okay? There's something unusual in today's age about the tactile nature of a piece of paper, okay? It's unusual in a day of email. Um, don't have to be wrong, you can get these little thank you notes at Staples and stuff, five bucks for a pack of 25 or something, they're real cheap. You can handwrite them as long as you've got decent handwriting. How many of y'all have decent handwriting? Few people these days. Okay? I'm not one of those. I have to really work to it, unless I'm writing all caps because I'm an engineer. It's fine to type a letter and send it. Just don't make it a three-paragraph letter. Short and sweet, it shouldn't it be the same amount of information in a typed letter. Okay? Not a whole lot, just remind them you exist. That's all you're trying to do. Okay? Thank them for their time. Uh, if you, This is where you get brownie points for this. If you get the Dear John letter, you know, Thanks for applying for the job. We're going to keep it in that round file next to my desk for six months and they won't empty it. You know? And most people didn't get all ticked off about that. This would be a great time to send them another thank you letter and say, I hear you filled the environmental scientist in one position at ACMECO. Congratulations on making a great hire. I remain very enthusiastic about the prospects and ability of opportunities available coming up at Acmeco, if you would, please contact me if any other opportunities arise, which I might be qualified for. Send that to the HR manager. That's highly, highly unusual and very mature, and it'll make you stand out again. If you interviewed well enough to get called back for a second interview or something, you're probably the kind of person they want to call back if they get another opening. This just wasn't happen to be, didn't happen to be the position for you at this time. Make sense? All right. How many of you know who uh, Chris Rock is? 
Okay. I read an article from the New Yorker. Chris Rock's an incredible person. If you ever get a chance, I mean, I love the comedy, but if you ever get a chance to see Chris Rock just talk, he's a brilliant man. There's a um, DVD out called Stand Up that has uh, Jerry Seinfeld and some others, and it's got a glimpse of Chris Rock just sitting around the table talking. He doesn't use his on-stage voice or anything. Brilliant man. In The New Yorker, the person interviewing him said, it must be incredible to you because everything that comes out of your mouth is just so hilarious. And he said, are you crazy? You don't know how many times I go out on stage and I've got material I think is fantastic. I deliver it and nobody laughs. And at that point, I've got a decision to make. One, I can blame the audience for being a bunch of rubes that don't know good comedy when they hear it. Or I can look at my performance and say, maybe I didn't tell it as good as I could. Or maybe that joke just wasn't funny. One of those paths will help me be more successful. Which one do you think Chris Rock's been taking for 20 years? Do you think that's probably good advice for you in an interview? If you don't get the interview, instead of getting all ticked off at them for not understanding you or being racist or homophobe or bigot or sexist or anything that doesn't involve your performance in the interview, which is what we tend to do, look at what you did. Everything was going good until I gave that answer about blah, blah, blah. Oh. Use it as a learning experience. Not every job. A hundred people apply for a job. Only one person is going to get it. That means 99 people. It doesn't mean they're losers. It just means this was not the perfect job for you. Don't try reading motives into the fact that the employer didn't get give the job to you. Does that make sense? Use it and grow. Now, this is the last thing I want to leave you with. But this sounds like a hell of a lot of work. And from my perspective as an interviewer, if I can't see you work hard for you, what makes me think you're going to work hard for me? Yeah, it's hard work, but it's necessary work. And it's the first work that you're going to do that I'm going to be able to look at and say, they put in the preparation, they put in the time, they knew their subject matter, that's the kind of person that I want. That's what I want to leave you with. If you'll do that, you would be well on your way to getting hired anywhere, anytime, at any place. Because that's the kind of employees we're all looking for. My name's Rob McElroy. I've been proud to make an impact on my industry for 25 years now. And I'm absolutely positive if you'll keep on course with where you're going, be fully prepared when you get there, each of you can too. Thank you very much. sent them to the personal, it depends on who it is. I've interviewed with board of directors and I'll send them to their personal home addresses if I can find it. It's, it's interesting because the bigger the company is, the more formal their mail system is. A handwritten note to a business looks like personal mail that won't get open. And it'll go all the way to exactly the person you intended to go to. A tight envelope looks like business correspondence will be opened by somebody in the mailroom. And oh, and I think that's supposed to go to HR. And it might not even make it to the person you're trying to send it to. Um, I try to make sure I get it to the person I'm sending it to. If I can find a home, you don't want to be a stalker, but you know, if it's somebody you can get a home address for and it's not creepy. I send it to their home address, but it, it's probably the better answer is to send it to the business address. Just make sure the bigger the company, the harder it is to actually get it all the way to them. Understand? I will stay as long as you want to talk. I'm not in any rush. I got nothing to do. Um, is there a difference if an HR department um, emails you versus a business email? Like the actual directors of the program? Like when you're scheduled for an interview, it's going to be with HR. No, uh, it, it, it's different. 
but it's different in an important way that you need to understand. Because HR, the only thing that they're doing is screening, which means you're just trying to stay in the game. And you know, the, the other key part of this as well is about your resume. Is you know, and, and I'm, I probably should add this too. This is not a resume class, but you need to have a custom resume for every job you apply for. It needs to be custom written for that position, having the keywords that come up in the job description itself. Because most of the screening that's going on now happens with a computer. That's why you see more and more online applications, because they can just feed that straight into the computer and it just does a word search. And if the keywords from the job description show up more often, you're more often likely to get interviewed by HR, which is just another screening mechanism to get through to the person you're really trying to talk to. It's important, but it's different. It's just a screening interview. You're just trying to stay in the game, stay in the game, stay in the game. You're trying to get the job with the hiring interview. That's who you're really trying to get to. Okay. It might take you two or three times to get to that person. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes? Sometimes the interviewer asks the questions like, uh, why do we select you? Why should we select